You got enough money, you can go to any place you want. And they'll be happy to see you come in there. Oh, you gave us some money? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, I'm happy to see you here. Integrity, honor, valor. Oh, oh, I got connections. I know this person here. So, yeah, you can come on in. Yeah, you can. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. You brought some poison for our work? Come on. Father doesn't work like that. You seen Jesus on the floor of the temple. You seen Bear on the floor of the Continental Congress, Convention of Philadelphia, Liberty Bell Square, East Lawn, the Constitution Center. is that once we discover how insufficient we are, we discover how completely more than sufficient God is. That's why it makes so much sense to declare our dependence and give our lives to Him. The Bible says we should be doers of the Word, not just hearers. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can do that right now. Simply go to Him and acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and that you're transferring your trust to Him alone because of His death on the cross and resurrection from the dead. In fact, I'm going to say a little prayer, and you can repeat it after me. You just have to mean it for yourself. Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner and that I can't save myself. I believe Jesus Christ, your Son, died on the cross in my place for my sin. And I now am trusting Him alone to forgive me and to give me the gift of eternal life that He promised to give to anyone who came to Him for it. Thank you for saving me and help me from this day forward to live a life pleasing to you. Congratulations. Welcome to the family. The Alternative, the Urban Alternative. Mm. Both were selling out heaven and hell. He had both had a vision. Franklin seen the configurations. Do good sojourn. He could see. I guess that is right. You'd have to check with the Harvard Philosophical Society. In our culture, gentleness can sometimes be perceived as a sign of weakness or a lack of confidence. But today on Truth For Life Weekend, Alistair Begg explains that biblical gentleness is actually a form of strength and it's essential for spiritual growth. We're in Galatians chapter 5, verse 23, continuing our study of the fruit of the Spirit. Writing on the fruit of the Spirit in 1839, a Dutch Reformed pastor by the name of Bethune observed, quotes, There may be no grace less prayed for or cultivated than gentleness. And I think we would be forced to agree that his comment still stands. Ben Franklin was born coming over in 1702. So he was born on a ship coming across the year that Penn turned in his charter of privilege and First Continental Congress adopted it. Sowed the seed. Now Franklin, when he grew up and became a man, he was challenging all the time because he wanted to own what he wanted to own. He even sold himself, from what I was told, from what your books say, as a bisexual and lived with homosexuals. So yeah, and he came forward in 1752 when the people of Philadelphia celebrating their freedom in Jubilee, 50 years. That's what the Liberty Bell was cast for, did you know that? They made the Liberty Bell to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Penn's Charter Privilege. I wonder how long it is since any of us actually knelt down and said, Lord Jesus Christ, would you send me the fruit of a gentle spirit? It may be some time, whether we as a church have actually gone to God and said, uh, Lord Jesus, will you make amongst us such a spirit of gentleness that those who are most in need of your care may encounter it here. One of the reasons that it is neglected is because it is as misunderstood as it is undervalued. When people think of gentleness, they often think that it means some kind of spinelessness or weakness. And so, particularly men who have been interested in muscles, and being macho, do not find themselves immediately drawn to the idea of a gentle and a quiet spirit. And indeed, many uh, females in contemporary society apparently are not very interested in it either. Uh, the Greek word is proutes, that is a word that is most used. It is translated meekness almost routinely in the authorized version and uh, variously here in the ESV and the NIV and so on. Meekness or gentleness is essentially strength under control. Fourteen years before the Declaration of Independence was written.
In the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, Bill of Rights, these things are written as you live. There's a continuum. Same thing as uh, seeing your neighbors around you. The Declaration is a continuum, self-governance. And that ties in when Christ was conceived, the conception of Christ, the immaculate conception. No more sin. You cannot look at somebody doing whatever they were doing and say they were sinning. Strength under control. That Moses was a meek man. And that he was able to take on these characters and beat them down was an indication of his physical strength and prowess. And yet he was referred to as meek. If you had opened your Bible to Galatians 5, you would see that gentleness stands in direct contrast to the works of the flesh, which Paul points out before he comes to the fruit. Uh, works of the flesh, which include enmity and strife, rivalries, dissensions, and divisions. And gentleness is particularly the counterpart of anger. It is not a temperament, nor is it a personality. It is, with the rest of the fruit, an outflow of the love of God. The love which heads the list, as we've seen each time. No one had the right to do that. That was taken away. That was placed upon each other and themselves. And ordinance of law was put in for trespass to make sure that justice was upheld. What was yours was yours, what was theirs was theirs. But allegory in uh, the Spanish Inquisition, I think that's what Isabella gave, you know, Columbus the financing for. Because the in Inquisition was going to impede upon Ferdinand, her son, the king's son, King Ferdinand, and all their people. The people of Europe were no longer tolerant. They no longer wanted to be subjects of uh, Great Britain or the British crown. They didn't want to be annexed as royals, property. They wanted to own themselves, self-ownership. Self-governance, that's what God made us to be. And as I've studied it this week, I've looked down two lines. One, I've realized that this gentleness involves a Godward dimension in as much as it involves, first of all, submission to God. Submission to God in all of his word and in his works. And then in its manward side, uh, consideration of others. Aristotle, who was good at definitions, defined meekness as the happy medium between excessive anger and excessive angerlessness. A balance that we discover only perfectly in the Lord Jesus. Jesuit, a very, very small and unusual type of sect. It came walking out of thin air, like in the uh, Mount of Transfiguration, into the consciousness of man. There was already expecting him, from the word already being told, from years before he ever walked, when he walked years before he ever was. In fact, in one sense, in relationship to the totality of this uh, orb of Christian godliness, as well as in relationship to it in its individual aspects, to think gentleness, think Jesus. Think gentleness, think Jesus. James, in the passage that we read, James, the brother of Jesus, has urged his lead readers to conduct themselves in the meekness and gentleness of wisdom. A wisdom which he goes on to say, not only in, is pure and peaceable and reasonable, but it is also gentle. Now we have to acknowledge that this comes really out of left field when you think about the climate in which we're living. We live in a culture where gentleness is arguably not a commonly admired quality. That's why, you see, as we've said, in making the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ attractive in a dark culture, these characteristics are wonderful. That's why Paul, not only in Galatians, but also in the rest of the epistles, is saying to his readers again and again, make sure you're not wearing your old clothes. Make sure you have taken off the clothes that mark your pre-converted life, and make sure that you're wearing the clothes that are provided by the grace of God. So yes, we're up to that point now. And we're going to learn this. And as we learn this, is peace. Peace is given, peace is restored, peace is instilled. And only a witness and only a testimony. So people know, people know. And part of our clothing, let lowliness or gentleness or humility become my inner clothing. And so that that which is then both inner and unidentifiable in an ostensible way will eventually reveal itself especially to those who know us best. Now, as I said and have said on every occasion, each of these uh, studies could be a series of studies in their own. 
I resist the temptation. And I want us to follow the line in the time that we have along a progression that goes like this. I want us, first of all, and briefly, to look at three pictures. Then, take a lesson from Paul. All right? So, first of all, three pictures. The first of these is in Isaiah chapter 40. If you like to turn to it, you'll be able to identify it. And I will allow you to find it later. Again, we're not going to delay and expound all of these. But here's the picture, Isaiah 40 and verse 11, speaking of God, a picture of God that is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. And then you'll see the miraculous. I don't know how much it's going to be uh, perceivably uh, like a supernatural way, but it's just physics, quantum, and straightening out, and making plumb and making true. A lot of the lies and everything, that's, that's why they call it witchcraft, to deceive, to mislead. In verse 10, uh, God is described in all of his sovereign power. Here in verse 11, the sovereign is also shepherd. He tends his flock. He has a general care of those who are his own. He does so as a shepherd. Those who have particular needs, the lambs he gathers in his arm. He carries them in his bosom and he gently leads those that have young. That's a wonderful and a compelling picture of the might, the majesty, the untrammeled strength, authority, and sovereignty of God stooping down into our little lives and dealing with us in this way. Gentle. And when you fast forward and find this quoted in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 12, which you can do now or later at your leisure, but in Matthew chapter 12, where it is quoted in verse 15 or so, Jesus withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all, and he ordered them not to make him known. And, says Matthew, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Here he is. He doesn't quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He deals gently with the hurting, those who are spiritually weak, those who are of little faith. The third picture is still in the prophets, and that's in Zechariah. You'll be familiar with it, won't you? Zechariah 9, 9. Again, a prophecy that we find fulfilled in Matthew, in Matthew 21, where we read again of the servant of the Lord. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. And all sets. Even the bail we made for good is because... God still makes it the compliment, because all things belong to God. All your money, all your time, everything there is, your family, your work, your careers, your dreams, your ambitions. They're all emotions of God, all expressions of God. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey. What an amazing thing this is. That the king of the universe, the creator of it all, the Lord of glory, as he steps down into time, as he makes himself known. It's interesting, isn't it, that in his self-designation, he refers to himself as gentle. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest and take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle. You're not going to come to somebody if you're afraid. If you think they're going to send you away, if they'll throw out the smoking flags, if they'll dump the bruised reed, no, he's gentle, gentle with his disciples. When he looks at them and sees that they're really tired, when they've come back and reported on their travels. And in Mark 6, Jesus says to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. Such gentleness. Those are the pictures. Now, learning from Paul. Learning from Paul. The apostolic pattern follows the pattern of the Lord Jesus. Why do you say, think he says, uh, love your enemy, you know, and, and pray for your enemy? I don't know, reverence? And we often say that after...
after the resurrection of Jesus in terms of an apologetic, in terms of a testimony to the truthfulness of Christianity, probably the most compelling uh, testimony and argument in defense of uh, Christian truthfulness is the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Anybody who reads that story realizes there's a dramatic change that we have to explain as having taken place in this man. A radical change in him because he had been such a tyrant. He was, uh, Luke tells us, uh, there at the execution of Stephen. He was such a fearful figure that when actually he professed to be a follower of Jesus, the followers of Jesus didn't want to have anything to do with him. They were afraid that he would even show up at their assemblies because he'd been breathing out threatenings and slaughter. Well, what in the world happened to him? What in the world happened to him? Well, he was transformed by the power of Christ. And the work of the Holy Spirit in his life was to produce the fruit of the Spirit in his life. He asks the Corinthians when he writes to them, and he is concerned for them that they, that they would be under his directive and his discipline. He says to them, what do you prefer? This is 1 Corinthians 4. Shall I come to you with a whip or in love and with a gentle spirit? He knew what it was to be involved in the former situation. For all life, do not raise your hand one against the other. How long do you think God's been dealing with this? How long do you think it takes a human being to reach full consciousness when they're told that they're scattered, that there is no omnipotence, there's only individual vacuums, and they have absolutely nothing to do with each other? In the second letter to the Corinthians, he says that he is entreating them by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. Now, when you read that, and I wonder, at least I wonder, maybe you will wonder with me, if it was not that he was just temperamentally so other than gentle. You know, I mean, he obviously was able to do a pretty good job of hounding down these believers. He wasn't a sort of milk toast kind of character. Uh, he was a well-educated fellow. He knew where he stood. He had convictions about certain things and enough to make sure that he would drive these people uh, underground if he could. And yet in law and physics and dynamics and character and structure and neighborhoods and community and buildings, if they're all one place doing one thing and one objective in a direct and intentional fashion, that's why they're not unintended consequences. They're considered happy accident. In God, the unintended consequence, the bad being made for good, is nothing more than a happy accident waiting to happen. Now we're going to reincorporate Kenston into the conservation easement and raise Penn's charter privilege and seal Philadelphia as the 51st state. So I wonder if it is not simply this, that his recurring emphasis, and it is a recurring emphasis on gentleness, that as he urges uh, those who are under his care and those to whom he writes, in relationship to this, that it is a reminder to him of the wonder of God's grace. It is a reminder to him of the fact that apart from the work of the Spirit of God, he would know nothing about gentleness because he was the blasphemer, the persecutor, the insolent person who had been shown mercy. If you look in the epistles, you will find that he says it again and again. For example, Philippians 4, remember he says, Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. What does he say next? Let your gentleness be known to everyone. You rejoice in the Lord. Don't be anxious. Let your gentleness be known to the Lord. Explains the nature of discipline within the church in the beginning of Galatians chapter 6. What does he say? He says that people who are spiritual, who exercise the role of discipline in the life of someone who has fallen by the way, you should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. So that the whole understanding of discipline, exercised within a fellowship, exercised on a one another basis, is in recognition of the fact that the one to whom we ultimately go, he's not a bully, he's not ostentatious, he doesn't snuff us out, he doesn't ditch us, he gives us an opportunity again and again and again and again. He responds to us with amazing gentleness. Therefore, how then could I be the child of that king? Then we have our representative back. That's the representative cast of Washington, Kit. Even Donald Trump cast of all our presidents and all our president's men into one being 
and the CIA and the whatever storytellers they got out there. I just pray that Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, takes this opportunity to address the economy and economical issues and uh, militant and military espionage, but that he takes authority over the Federal Reserve and the FDIC and uh, breaks the sovereign immunity uh, court officers gave the court officers, four court officers, above the law, above the Constitution, above man. He's not a bully. He's not ostentatious. He doesn't snuff us out. He doesn't ditch us. He gives us an opportunity again and again and again and again. He responds to us with amazing gentleness. Therefore, how then could I be the child of that king and operate in any other way? It's not an option. Thirdly, and finally, a spiritual MRI. I do know, because I'm told, that it is an effective means of showing what's really going on inside. It can reveal the absence of something that we were hoping to find there, and it can reveal the presence of something that we don't want to see there. I don't know about you, but as I've gone down this list, love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and our gentleness has been like a spiritual MRI showing up in my heart things that I hoped I wouldn't see and failing to show up things that I long to see. Governors, no, Donald Trump knows already this doesn't float. That'd be like somebody coming in to, uh, to build a vending machine down in Mary Largo and once he gets into the building for building the vending machines, putting that on the side and saying, oh, no, 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 I own the place. I'm going to tell you how to do everything here. Excuse me, you are a vending machine attendant. You're going to tell me now that you're the President of the United States? Not that it couldn't be. They are undercover bosses. But there's time between now and then. Because what you've shown and what you've exhibited, just me managing to get in here to have a position to fill these vending machines, does show valor, does show character, does show intent. In the 139th Psalm, uh, the psalmist begins by acknowledging that God knows all about him, knows all of his activities, knows all of his words, and knows even all of his thoughts. What is true of David is also true of us. At the end of that psalm, he then very briefly invites God to search him out at the level of his heart. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is anything in me that grieves you, that makes you sad. So let's take the test. Two parts. In relationship to our submission to God, in relationship to our consideration of others. Submission to God, part one of the test. Do I have a teachable spirit? A teachable spirit. Therefore put away all filthiness, writes James, rampant wickedness, and receive with gentleness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. You're never going to benefit from the Bible, he says. If you come with a filthy mind, if you come with an argumentative spirit, you can sit for a thousand years and listen to the Bible taught, and it will be as water on a duck's back. It will be as rain on a tin roof. That's why he says, you see, it is essential that the fruit of gentleness, of humility of heart, is revealed in the way in which we listen to the word of God being taught. But if you're doing it just to get the position and not to be the man, then there's no teaching there. You're just reading, you're reading for something by any means necessary. You're going to get there no matter how many people you got to under the bus to make the steps for you to walk up to be there. There's no secrets here. There's no secrets from God. Never has been, never will be. It can't be. You cannot keep a secret from God. You cannot keep a secret from yourself. You can deny it. You can block it all you want. But your body language, your spirit, your soul knows it's there. And it will bring it out. Iron sharpens iron. Also, a repenting heart in submission to God. Gentleness, sensitivity. Not only teachable to his word, but repenting when confronted by the truth of his word. None of us tonight is perfect. All of us make mistakes. We do bad things that we didn't want to do. We fail to do good things that we should have done. And we suffer if we fail to face up to these things. If we try to simply ignore them or to hide them, we will find at least this. One, that our fellowship with God is spoiled. And two, that our usefulness for God 
is diminished. The loss of abiding fellowship with God and usefulness in the service of God may be traced to an unrepentant heart. That's why Luther said repentance is a daily activity. So sensitive to the teaching of the word of God, repentant as the word of God comes to convict us. And then thirdly, that we would be marked by a trusting faith, a trusting faith. You see, it's very easy to talk about submission to God when everything is going well. Because you see, gentleness is not mainly developed in tranquility. Gentleness is developed in trials and difficulty. So the very things that I don't want to have in my life are the very things that in my life will make me the full or person that God wants me to be. I don't want to be sick. I don't want to be disappointed. I don't want my heart to be broken. I don't want any of these things. But God is sovereign in his dealings. He knows what he's doing. And he is expressly committed to conforming his children to the image of his only beloved son to make us in short order like Jesus in gentleness as in everything else. MRI, listening to God's word with a repentant heart a teachable spirit and a trusting faith. Part two of the test in consideration of others. And I'm just going to frame this in the questions that I wrote down for myself. If you find them painful, I'm absolutely thrilled. I don't see why I should have to find them as uncomfortable as I have found them. So here we are. This is the MRI. Here's the test. You're sliding down the tube. We're talking about a gentleness in relationship to God who is there and out there. But what about in relationship to one another? What about a gentle spirit in consideration of the needs and concerns of others? The first one. Are we considerate, generous, and fair in our dealings with others? But I did find it quite notable of how the continuum and everlasting and building a kingdom and seeing each other as collectively the body of straw receiving back its head. I thought it was very uh, <coughs> literally, figuratively, metaphorically, narratively correct. There's a new way to do algebra, I understand that, or trigonometry. Yes, the, the math is true, the math is sound. Or are we rigid, exacting, and demanding? Am I prepared to be gentle and sensitive to the pressures and insecurities that are the portion of my friends and my families and my colleagues? Do I show consideration to the mail carrier, the checkout clerk, the bank teller, and everyone else? Do we tell ourselves we are standing on principle when in fact we are merely insisting on our own opinions? Are we becoming increasingly compassionate, genial, reasonable, and kind, or disturbingly crusty, rigid, unyielding, and inflexible? And in our own personal lives, the same way. Are you impatient? I'm impatient. I'm just impatient generally. I, I, I want Insta grow. No, I want it all to grow now, tonight, tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll be so joyful, so peaceful, so gentle. Nobody will be able to stand me. I'll be so radiant and amazing. People will be coming over and taking their vacation just to be near me. Make me like this now, will you? But that just shows how impatient I actually am. And part of the fruit is patience. Words represent numbers and dots and jots and cuneiform and hieroglyphics, all things. No matter which way you want to, that's the Wongavator. Christ in your heart, that's the Wongavator. Kingdom Builder, well, maybe you would consider Innovator instead of Wongavator. Doesn't matter what's the position, Edgar Casey. Doesn't matter where you are or what's going on. I can come up and I can absorb and I can visualize and I can show you through upholding everything and all things accountable to the word, the storyline, the story, the narrative, the page, the word, as it's written, as will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Trusting God, asking him, fill me with the Holy Spirit, make me fruitful by your power. Do it for us as individuals, do it for us as a church. Please, we ask you. God is the one who causes spiritual growth. The Bible gives us instructions on how to live God-honoring lives. What does that look like practically? How do we navigate our daily routine? What does following Christ look like in an age of social media? Instead, it all begins with knowing the God of creation, having a personal, intimate relationship with Him, and it involves living joyfully under His will and authority. Thank you, Jesus. Sunday morning, March... 
22nd, 2020.